Good evening, everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. Let me set up my screen here. Okay. <clears throat> so we're going to try to knock out the, uh, the end of the first chapter of Revelation. We've gone through very slowly introducing the book, introducing the type of literature that it is, and the type of expectation the type of expectations that we as readers should have coming to this book. Uh, we saw that the book uh, is a letter and uh, as an uh, epistolary beginning, you know, John to the seven churches, grace and peace. Uh, we also saw that it is uh, prophecy. And of course the primary purpose of prophecy is God speaking to the people in the present for their situation, uh, either offering them hope or offering them some sort of rebuke because they're on the wrong path or on the wrong way. And so, of course, we should expect that uh, in this particular book. <clears throat> and uh, John has introduced himself, John the, uh, John the writer, John the revelator, John the seer, John the prophet, whatever you want to call him. He is all of those things. <clears throat> and and uh, he, he said that he was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So um, let's see. Let me see. Um, I'm just backing up a little bit here, just kind of get a sense of, of where we're at. Um, he says, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice or a loud sound like the sound of a trumpet, okay? So he's on this island. He's in the spirit. He's already in a spiritual state of things. He's in some sort of spiritual trance, you might say. He's, he's receiving this visionary experience, and he hears behind him just the sound or this voice it was like a trumpet. That's the best thing that that uh, he could use to describe it. And this trumpet-like sound. I mean, uh, that's something else that I think we need to we need to realize is that um, is that apocalyptic literature is supposed to be a literature that kind of it, it, it punches us in the feels. It it it's something that's supposed to be experienced. And we we listen to these words and we need to think to ourselves, how does this make me feel? Does this make me feel good? Does this make me feel uncomfortable? Does this make me feel a sense of awe? Does this make me feel a sense of terror? And so it's, it's, it's deliberately written to, uh, to evoke and to provoke various feelings. And so, you know, just ask yourself that, like, you know, how, how are you emotionally responding when you're hearing these things? Okay. Um, behind him, here's, here's this trumpet and this trumpet sound says to write in a book literally write in a scroll what you see and send it to the seven churches, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. And then I turn to see the voice. Okay. He's already got to reorient himself. Okay. Behind him, he heard a sound like a trumpet that's telling him to, to write these things down. And he, even though he's already in a, a relationship with the spirit, even though he's in a spiritual visionary trance he still has to reorient himself and look the other way okay he still has to make sure that he is uh, doing what he needs to to pay attention okay and something else here too i didn't mention this last time but this is going to be a uh, an interesting uh interpretive point <clears throat> um is that uh let me actually back up and see how this is okay um is that sometimes the book of revelation is first going to tell you something okay or something or someone is going to one of the you know heavenly beings or god or an angel or jesus they're going to tell john something and then when he looks and he sees it what he sees further unpacks what he was just told okay so you got to remember that so it, it's it's a common theme that we're going to see in revelation uh we're going to see it in chapter five we're going to see it in chapter seven and we definitely see it here is that he hears something first, and then when he turns and looks at it, what he sees further unpacks and gives clarity to what he hears, okay? So whatever he hears first is not the last word. It's not the final word in the description of whatever that thing was. Whatever he sees right after it is going to give clarity to, um, to, to that aspect of, of the visionary experience, okay? So, so hearing first, seeing second, and what he sees further unpacks and clarifies what he hears. A good example is in chapter five, where he, um, he hears to stop weeping because the lion of the tribe of Judah 
the root of David has conquered. And so, okay, what does he hear? He hears that Jesus is a lion-like conquering figure. But then when he turns and he looks, it's not a lion. It's a lamb that's been crucified. How does Jesus conquer as a ferocious lion? He does it by dying, not as a ferocious animal, but as a weak animal. And so what he sees further unpacks what he's already heard, okay? So that's a, that is a literary theme in this book that we need to, I'm telling you now, you need to be aware of it, uh, but here's a good place, okay? He's already heard behind him this powerful sound of a trumpet that is commissioning him authoritatively that he needs to take the things that he is receiving in this visionary experience and to communicate it to these seven churches. And then when he turns, verse 12, when he turns to see this voice, Think about that. He's turning to see a voice speaking with me. And what does he see? He sees the seven golden lampstands, verse 13. And in the middle of the lampstands, he sees one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to his feet, girded across his chest, was with a golden sash. Okay. So he hears this powerful voice. It's this powerful trumpet. Okay. Uh, and oftentimes a trumpet uh, in the Bible indicates that somebody important is coming, okay? The trumpet sounded, I believe it's in Exodus 19, before the arrival of God on Mount Sinai, on Mount Horeb. And of course, at the last trumpet, at the final trumpet, Jesus is going to return. Uh, we know that from uh, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, 51 through 52, at the last trumpet, that's going to happen. And then we know later in Revelation 11, 15, at the seventh trumpet, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdom of God and of his Christ. OK, um, so someone is coming. How do we know what that is? Well, it's the son of man. Actually, it's one like the son of man. Uh, and he is in the middle of the seven lampstands. OK, we talked about this before. We talked about this last week because we know down here you can see that right here. Got it highlighted. The seven lampstands are the seven churches. OK, so I made some notes about this. I made some notes about a lampstand. OK, because remember. Revelation is trying to give symbols and imagery to further define and explain its message, okay? So to say that a church is a lampstand, well, for me, that brings about, uh, that brings about two different points, okay? Number one is that a lamp or the lampstand involves temple imagery, okay? I talked about how that these, uh, the Solomon's temple had 10 of these lampstands and Herod's temple uh, had one of these lampstands, and so Jews who knew what that lampstand symbolized uh, knew that it symbolized the temple and the presence of God in that particular temple. Of course, the lampstand you see in reference to Hanukkah, which is the Jewish festival that commemorates the rededication of the temple, as described in First and Second Maccabees. And so here to say that the church is a lampstand is another way of saying the church is the new temple of God. Okay, The church is the place in which God dwells and the place where the Spirit dwells course that's not new to us we've already learned that um in paul paul's already said that you second person plural are the temple of god okay we also know that a lampstand functions as a lamp as a sense of outreach and evangelism jesus said in matthew 5 you are the light to the world okay and by the way there in matthew 5 in the sermon of the mount that's also second person plural not you as a singular person you collectively the body of christ you are the light to the world now, formerly, uh, in Isaiah, the, the servant, God's servant, uh, is also called the light to the world. In Isaiah 42, Isaiah 49, Isaiah 51. And, of course, Jesus himself in the New Testament embodies that vocation of the servant. And Jesus can say in, Matthew, or in John 8 and verse 12 that I am the light of the world. So uh, a lampstand, obviously, even in the Sermon on the Mount, you, you don't, you know, where do you put the lamp? You don't hide under a bush, bushel, you, you put it up, and the lamp functions as a sense of outreach and a sense of evangelism. So we're seeing there that the church is described in Revelation. It's revealing that the function of the church is to be a holy place, like the temple, which is definitely going to affect their behavior, how they view themselves, and how they identify themselves as a people distinct from the fallen world. Okay, but being distinct doesn't mean that you go hide away from the world and wait for Jesus to come back. No, as the holy people, as the light of the world, you have an outward function of evangelism and outreach and being people that affect unholy people with your holiness. Okay, so you see there how, um, how Jesus being in the midst of the lampstands 
indicates that Jesus is in the midst of the churches, and it gives purpose, it gives meaning, and it clarifies the identity and even the mission of the churches. Let me kind of actually just stop right there and just uh, just kind of open it up maybe just for a few minutes of of a uh, of, of discussion there. What do you, what do you guys think about that? What do you guys think of of how Revelation there is revealing? Um, I'm trying to full screen, whatever. Um, how do you guys feel about, about Revelation revealing the function of the church in that twofold way as the church is the new temple of God, meaning it's a holy entity because God is in its midst and the church functions as the light to the world in an outreach slash evangelistic um, image. What do you think? Well, Carol. uh, Carol's got her hand up. I didn't know. Okay, go ahead, Carol. Um, my question, my question is, um, does it, it? You've we've learned that the churches are the lampstands, and yet it also says that the lampstands would be removed from the churches. How does how can you can you clarify that a bit? Um. Well, I, I don't. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to read that too rigidly. Um, I mean, because we see here. Um, in 1 verse 20, that the churches are, or the lampstands are the seven churches. They're one-to-one -one equated, okay? And so to remove the lampstand from Ephesus means to remove that church. Uh, I mean, we, we haven't even gotten to that church yet. It's okay. church ness. I'm sorry? It's church ness, then. The, church, the essence of the fact that it, it, it has church ness. <laughs> yeah okay I'll... yeah well, to, well uh, the essence of it to take well i i mean i think it's it's the fact that that you know after jesus gave that warning and, and we're getting ahead of ourselves because we haven't even entered into that particular book um or into that chapter uh jesus threatens to take away their lampstand if they don't repent we know from history right now that there is no church in ephesus meaning jesus fulfilled that promise to remove that church from its existence, okay? They're no longer they're no no longer functioning as God's holy temple presence that is an outreach center of the gospel to the world in sharing God's holiness, God's love, God's grace, God's forgiveness, um, centered there in Ephesus. And I think that's, that's the best that I can do with okay. that imagery. Okay. okay. I think Thank Sarah you. Was say something. Yeah, Sarah was saying something. Um, sorry, I didn't know that uh, she had her hand up. I didn't see that. Um, I was just going to say, are any of those churches still in existence, though? Uh, that's that's a good question. Um, I mean, most of these cities right here are not named in the, with the same names anymore. Uh, they, they have different names. They just got different right. countries. Uh, right. I mean, these are all churches in what was called back then Asia Minor, but today it's the entire country of Turkey. So it, it's just its own. Every, a lot of things have changed from that there, um, but but we know for a fact that the uh, the church in Ephesus uh, is completely gone. Um, there is a uh, there is a fourth century Christian writer. His name escapes me. So you'll forgive me for this. Um, and he is writing from Thyatira, and what he actually says is that church, um, because of a church heresy. Um, was contaminated by a bunch of heretics and that church ceased to be but then a, a few years back that church came back into existence uh, and so he comments and he actually says that the early church um, enjoyed and relished and found uh, found comfort by reading the book of revelations one of the one of the earliest indicators that we actually have that people were reading the book of revelation early on and they were finding comfort to it that's by the way an argument against people saying that the book of revelation is not written towards the church is written for something in the future. Um, he indicates that within 300 years afterwards that, uh, that people were still reading it. And so, but he, he indicates that the church um, had died out and the church had been reborn, you know, with just a bunch of new people. So it's just, we, we have very little, um, we have very little data on this, um, but today you can go and visit. There's absolutely no church in Ephesus. It's just, it's just not there. I, I did a little bit of, of research into uh, the church at Ephesus and, and its history, and it was really interesting. They must have gotten their act together up to this morning, 
because it did last a very, very long time. I, I'm, I'm not remembering the exact date off the top of my head. If it was, if it's either in the 1300s or the 1500s before the church finally ceased to exist there. And it was basically engulfed by Islam at that time. For a long time, they sort of coexisted with Islam, but then the people in that, in that city um, eventually, you know, all converted to Islam. And, uh, uh, but they, they, they must have gotten their act together because it was a, it, you know, after this time period, they, it, it was a church for a very long time. It was a, um, the site of at least one church council. Yeah, Council of Ephesus. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but anyway, I, I don't want to, I don't want to jump into that kind of stuff yet. I, that, these, these things really, they're not really answering my questions. I'm, I'm, I was want, I was wanting to pull out from the fact that Revelation reveals something about the purpose of Christian congregations, specifically that they're to be God's holy presence in a sense of a new temple, which affects their identity, it affects their behavior, and it's supposed to be a light to the world, meaning that the purpose of the churches is to be an evangelistic outpost or an evangelistic outreach, kind of like a um, – what, what do they call those? Uh, the, the, the light lighthouses. Um, that's how they're supposed to function. And so when we read this, we think to ourselves, is this how we are viewing ourselves as the body of Christ? Are we viewing ourselves as holy people set apart and distinct from the world? But because we're God's holy people, we are set apart for a purpose, which is to be speaking the word of God to other people in hopes that they accept it and, you know, come to find truth and redemption. So, that's just kind of a that that's what I think this uh, that this book is revealing at least on this particular point. But I do want to hold off. We will spend we will spend considerable time looking at the seven churches. But I don't want to get ahead of ourselves on this. <clears throat> okay, let's um let's kind of pick back up here. I want to look here at the at the description of Jesus. Okay, the description of Jesus. Um, he's the one in the midst of the seven churches, indicating that Jesus, despite the fact that he is sitting at God's right hand, he's enthroned at God's right hand. Uh, Jesus is in the midst of the seven churches, meaning that Jesus is present in some sense. Jesus knows what's going on. He's aware of our deeds. Uh, he's not the absentee landlord. Um, he's, he's aware of what's going on. He's aware of the fact that we are suffering at times. He's also aware of the fact that, that, that we sin at times. Okay. Uh, so Jesus knows. And he's described here, by the way, as, um, He's wearing a robe, girded on his chest. He has a golden sash, okay? His head and his hair were, like, were white, like white wool. By the way, notice this, 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 uh, this comparative word. He doesn't, John doesn't know the best way to explain it, so the best thing he can say is that it was like white wool. It was like snow, and his eyes were like the flame of fire, okay? I just want you to picture this in your mind. You get this, this you, you hear this massive trumpet behind you. You turn and you look. And it's this glorious figure who, let me just kind of look at these things here. Um, you know, he's, he's wearing this long robe. He's got a gold sash. His hair is just white and it's just bright like wool and snow. His eyes are, are on fire. Verse 15, his feet were like burnished bronze. By the way, this word for burnished bronze is the very first time that it appears in any sort of literature. Uh, and so it's like he, John has to like make up a word <laughs> to, to even to even explain what he's trying to say. There's no evidence of this word for burnished bronze prior to the book of Revelation. Um, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. I mean, when Jesus, I mean, just think of like Niagara Falls. Just think of like how loud and how powerful all those waters are. I mean, it's just a, a powerful image there. Now. Where is he drawing this this imagery from? Okay, what does it mean from all these from these things? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna look at uh, a passage here um, in the book of Daniel. Uh, there it is. Okay, all right. Um, in Daniel chapter seven. Okay, and I'm gonna start here in verse nine. All right, so we're in Daniel seven and verse nine. And Daniel says, I kept looking until thrones were set up and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow. Okay. And the hair on his head was pure wool. Throne was set ablaze. 
wheels for burning fire. Okay. Um, and then we have down in verse 13, I kept looking in the night visions, just down here, behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. He came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. Okay. What we're seeing here is that we have a description here of the ancient of days, and we have a description here of the son of man. And what Revelation is doing here is it's, it's taking both of those images and it's applying both of them to Jesus. Okay. Do you see, see what's happening there? Now, what does this mean? Does this mean that Jesus is God? No, that's not what it's meaning. It means that Jesus is the one that is revealing God because God gave this revelation to Jesus. It means that Jesus, who is the exalted and risen Lord, upon whom God has invested his name, his traits, his, uh, his authority, that, that Jesus represents God in the fullest way. Just like in the Gospel of John, where Jesus can say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, because the Father is always behind Jesus. Jesus is there representing God, representing the Father in every possible way. So in this image of Jesus here, it combines images of the Son of Man. He's called the Son of Man in verse 13, right there. And it, it combines images of, uh, of the Ancient of Days as the one whose hair was like white wool, like snow, okay? So n notice there's a quick, easy, knee-jerk reaction that people who want a high Christology can take with this and say, ah, look at there, Jesus is God. I don't, I don't think that's what's going on. It's the exalted Jesus who fully represents God, the exalted Jesus um, uh, who has received all authority and power on heaven and on earth, and the exalted Jesus that is revealing this message that we've seen from the beginning. Remember chapter one and verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his bond servants. Okay. So Jesus is revealing this, but God gave this to Jesus. So, you know, from whom is this coming? Is it coming from Jesus or is it coming from God? Well, it's coming from both. It came ultimately from God and then God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to John. No, sorry, excuse me. Jesus gave it to the angels. The angels gave it to John. John gave it to the bond servants. And now we're reading it today. Okay. But do you see what you see? What's going on there? Um, in verses uh, twelve, thirteen. Or, well, yeah, uh, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, and fifteen. We have uh, lots of descriptions there. I didn't even read. Yeah, I, did, I read fifteen. We have lots of descriptions there that are combining images of the ancient of days and images of the Son of Man and putting them all together on Jesus because Jesus fully represents God. Let me tell you, as Unitarians, you you cannot be upset about that. That should not make you feel uncomfortable. You need to have an understanding of Jesus that allows you to be comfortable saying those things, okay? I've seen some some people, um, you know, say that, uh, you know, that, that Jesus is nothing like God, but that's just, that's just not true. Jesus is, is the closest human being to God that we have ever met. Jesus fully represents God in every possible way that a human being can do. So uh, I, I think we need to be comfortable saying that. And be comfortable making making those particular points. By the way, the most exalted things that are said about Jesus in the Bible are after his resurrection. After his resurrection. After Jesus' resurrection, he was given all authority on heaven and on earth. And Philippians 2 says that God exalted Jesus and gave him the name which is above every name. Okay? So Jesus shares God's authoritative name. Why? Not because Jesus is God, but because God is sharing that with Jesus, and God has invested that authority in Jesus. So when we see Jesus looking and sounding like God, it doesn't mean that he is God. It means that he is God's fullest agent and God's fullest representative in the best sense of that word. Okay? <clears throat> uh, let's see here. Um, move on a, a little bit. Okay. Uh, yes, we read there in verse 15. Voice like the sound of many waters. I mean, he's a he's a very very powerful figure that's that's uh, that that is revealing this message and has kind of snuck up behind John as John has reoriented himself. Okay, now notice this: in his right hand he held seven stars. Okay, now let me ask you: is it significant at all that he says it's in his right hand? Why not his left hand? Okay, let, let me just ask you, just based on your understanding of the scriptures. What is the significance of Jesus having something or possessing something in his right hand? 
What do you think? What what is that? What image does that bring to the right mind? Right hand is the hand of blessing. I'm sorry. The right hand is what? The hand, the hand of, blessing. of blessing. It's a hand of blessing. A, a hand of blessing. Okay. Okay. So the, the, it's a hand that blesses. What else? Strength. Say, say it again. It's sorry. Favored. Strength. Strength. Yeah, that's it's definitely the okay. One on the right. Right. Remember when uh, Jesus was exalted to heaven? Where is right he sitting? hand of God. Yeah. Is that the right, the right hand, hand of God? Of God. He, he's sitting, I mean, he's God's right hand man. Okay. The right hand is a, is the hand of power. It's the hand of authority. It's, I mean, most people in the Bible are right handed. Okay. That, that's, that's how you get things done. That's how you accomplish things. So here we say that um, in his right hand, he is holding seven stars. What, what does that mean about that image? That means that Jesus is in control of whatever these seven stars are. Okay, well, he hasn't he hasn't revealed yet. We're going to learn at the end of the chapter what it is. But Jesus is holding these seven stars. Okay, now let me tell you. Let me show you a, a coin from the first century. Okay, there's a coin in the first century. Okay, this was this was minted during the time that the Book of Revelation was written. How do we know this? Because this is this is Domitian. Okay, Domitian was the emperor from the year eighty one. To 96. Okay, so his reign overlapped to the writing of the book of Revelation. And so here you've got Domitian, and it says he's Domitian. He is the son of the divine Caesar. Now on the back, you've got Domitian's child. The child's name is Jupiter. What do you think that, that, that big sphere thing is that, that, that the child is sitting on? What does that image look like to you? What is he sitting on? Is it a ball of yarn? Is it a kickball? Wouldn't that be the world? It is the world. Okay, now what is the image of the emperor's son? And if the emperor is called God, what is the, the image of the son of God sitting on the world? What does that mean? He's the ruler. Right. The, all right, so this, this is an image saying that the emperor and his family, they are ruling the world, okay? Now notice this that's going around here. What is this? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Surrounding the emperor's son, who is sitting on the world, are seven stars. What sort of imagery would you, if you had this coin, be telling you? It would tell you that the royal family, the emperor's family, not just the emperor, but his entire family, they rule the world, and surrounding them are the seven stars. What did Revelation just tell us? Revelation just said that Jesus holds the seven stars. What did Revelation already tell us? In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, that Jesus is the ruler of the kings of the earth. Okay? Revelation is telling us something different than what the culture is trying to shove down your throats. The culture is saying, no, the Roman emperor is God, his children are the sons of God, and the Roman emperor and his family, they rule the world, they are the ruler of the kings of the earth, and the seven stars surround them. Revelation says, no, Jesus is the true ruler of the kings of the earth, and Jesus holds the seven stars, okay? So don't tell me that the book of Revelation has no context in the first century. That's a joke, okay? I mean, you look at that. What does that mean to you? I mean, you don't have to, like, have words on that. that is, it's very, very powerful. You can see that. You can see, you can see the mission there, and if you can kind of read the Latin letters, you can kind of make out the mission. You see a childlike figure. By the way, his child's name was Jupiter. And his child had, had died um, during, uh, during his reign. Um, but sitting on a globe and surrounded by seven stars. This is a coin that was minted right around the time when the book of Revelation was written. Okay? To hey, me, it's very, very powerful. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, do, we, do, do historians know what those seven stars represented on that coin? I don't know in particular um, what that is. This is, this is something that... Uh, that they got out of a museum. Um, now there are uh, there are tons of Roman theologies that deal with astronomy and deal with magic and the looking at stars for that sort of stuff, but that's not necessarily a Jewish or a Christian thing. So, so I, I will admit that I I do not know what the seven stars mean right here. But what I do see here um, is a coin that was minted during the time of the book of Revelation 
uh, and thereby this imagery uh, to me is not a coincidence. So that, that, that's the, uh, that, you know, I, I can admit to you, I don't know. I don't, I don't know what's, uh, what, what that means. I, I probably could take some time and to dig into it, but, but the, the source that I got from this didn't say anything in regard to what the purpose of the seven stars meant. So. It'd be interesting to find out and see if there's even a further connection. Yeah, I'll tell you, there, there have been some people, there's, there's an entire commentary on the book of Relation that interprets every single thing um, through, through a, uh, like astrology and astronomy. I mean, some, someone was able to get as much information as they can. They tried to interpret the entire book that way. Um, it's been rejected by basically every scholar today as like, you're just reading all this into the, the text. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure I can try to dig this up, but um, like the vast consensus of scholars have said that astronomy and astrology uh, are not really relevant to understanding uh, these particular features. Now, granted, like this, this is something that's outside of the book, like, like this, this, this is a coin that I'm pointing to you that's not in the text. So, but yeah, I'll, I'll, if, if, I, if I figure that out, I'll, I'll mention it during the next time I teach. <clears throat> okay. Um, so Jesus holding in his hand seven stars. By the way, I'm just going to just give you the heads up. In verse 20, um, he says right here, these seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Okay. And by the way, I do think that this does refer to angels as in, angelic messengers, heavenly beings, okay? I don't think these are human messengers. Uh, I do think consistently throughout the book of Revelation that angels means angels, means heavenly attendants, heavenly messengers, heavenly emissaries, okay? Not, not human messengers. Um, we can have a discussion on that if you'd like, but uh, I think it's more consistent to see that he uses the same word to refer to the same image, uh, emissary. Anyway, so Jesus right there controls the seven angels, but it's not just seven. Remember, seven is the number of completion. I mean, she's has control of all the angels, okay? Let's look at this here. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. Out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, okay? Now, people think right here, oh, look, this means that Jesus is a warrior person, okay? By the way, this is the only weapon in the book of Revelation that will ever be used to describe Jesus. The only weapon that Jesus ever has in the book of Revelation is a sharp two-edged sword. But notice, it's not just a sharp two-edged sword that, you know, he's got in his hand or he's got in a hilt. It comes out of his mouth. It's a sword that comes out of his mouth. And this is drawing on the Old Testament and drawing on imagery from the Hebrew Bible, okay? So let's look at some of this, okay? I encourage you to, to follow along with me. Let's look at Isaiah chapter 11, okay? By the way, Isaiah chapter 11 is one of the uh, massive visions in Isaiah that deals with the kingdom and deals with uh, the description of the future Messiah. <clears throat> Let's look at this, okay? <clears throat> um, it says right here in Isaiah 11, verse 1, Then a shoot will spring forth from the stem of Jesse. Jesse, by the way, is King David's father. So this is a shoot that's stemming forth. This is a kind of a branch that's, that breaks off, not breaks off, but shoots out from Jesse's and David's family tree. So it's another way of saying the son of David. And he calls it again, a branch from his roots will bear fruit. Okay. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. Okay. So notice here that this Messiah is not the Lord because the spirit of the Lord is resting on him. He's got the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and strength, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Okay. This Messiah is going to fear the Lord. He's not going to be the Lord. He's going to fear the Lord. We get this. We understand this. He will delight in the fear of the Lord. He will not judge by what his eyes see, nor make a decision by, by what his ears hear, okay? So notice, he's going to judge. He's going to make a decision, okay? But with righteousness, he will judge the poor and decide with fairness the afflicted of the earth, okay? Now, let me ask you, how do you judge, make a decision, and even in verse four, judging and decide. Okay, how do you ultimately do that? You do it with your words. Okay, that's how you, you, you enact a judgment. You say this person is innocent. This person is guilty. You say this person is poor. This person is an afflicted person of the earth. You say it. Okay, so the judgment that this messianic person is going to do under the power and empowerment of the spirit of God, he does with his words, okay? But notice, this is a good sense of judgment. When you are judging the poor and you're judging the afflicted of the earth, you are 
you are judging in their favor. You're vindicating them. You're taking care of them. You're saying you shouldn't be poor. God is going to bless you and God's going to take care of you. You shouldn't be afflicted of the earth. We're going to remove those people who afflict you and you're going to be safe and secure and have peace and safety. Okay. That's a positive sense of judgment that he does with his words, but he will strike down the earth with the rod of his mouth. Okay. Notice his words, his mouth is also going to be an aspect of judgment. It's not going to be a real rod. He's not going to beat people down with the rod. It's going to be the rod of his mouth. And with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Okay? So notice here, we have a messianic figure who has a powerful word. But the powerful word does two things, and this gets missed out. The powerful word can either bless, comfort, guide, take care of, shepherd, in a positive sense, or if it needs to, it needs to act like the rod. It needs, it needs to discipline. And if people get out of line, he needs to slay the wicked. Okay? But notice he's doing this with, with his words. His words are powerful enough to bless and to comfort, and his words are powerful enough to convict and to judge. Okay? So, so keep that imagery there when we're thinking about a powerful sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus, okay? In the book of Revelation, which is a revelation of Jesus, his words, depending on who you are, if you're a person who, who is afflicted and in tribulation, then you are a person that is going to take the words of Jesus in the book of Revelation, and they're going to comfort you, they're going to shepherd you, they're going to guide you, they're going to encourage you. But if you're a sinner, they're going to rebuke you, they're going to chastise you, and they're going to discipline you. And ultimately, at the end, and on the day of judgment, it's the sword that comes out of the mouth of Jesus that ultimately deals with the foes. It's Jesus' judge, words of judgment that are going to defeat the enemy. Okay. By the way, notice here, Jesus doesn't, doesn't, uh, doesn't deal with people with traditional weapons. It's not with a real weapon. It's not with a real sword. It's with his words. Okay. And remember the word, the, the, the major word of Jesus is the gospel message, which is both good news, the kingdom is coming, you're going to be forgiven, you're going to have a resurrection body, you're going to live forever on a renewed world, or it could be a word of judgment. You're a sinner, and the judgment is coming if you don't repent, and when the kingdom comes, you're going to face judgment. Okay, so even the gospel is both a two-edged message, both of comfort and of judgment. Let's look at another place. Isaiah chapter 49. <clears throat> it's another, it's one of these uh, uh, servant psalms in Isaiah. Isaiah 49, where it says right here, listen to me, O islands. There's already imagery there because islands don't listen, by the way. Listen to me, O islands, and pay attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. So someone distinct from the Lord is being called from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He made my mouth, looky here, like a sharp sword. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. Okay, so, so this person who was called from the womb, remember how the Messiah was, uh, was born from the womb of Mary, someone distinct from God? His mouth is like a sharp sword. And look what God is going to do. I'm just going to read this fairly quickly because i got to get down to verse 6. In the shadow of his hand, he has concealed me. He has made me like a select arrow. He has hidden me in his quiver. Basically, he's God's choice weapon towards the islands, towards the peoples. He said to me, you are my servant, Israel. That's an important point because Isaiah 49 was originally written to Israel as a nation. Jesus takes this and embodies the vocation of Israel as a nation upon himself as the Messiah, in whom I will show my glory. God is going to show his glory through Israel, through his servant, to the islands, to the peoples. But I said, oh, man, I just clicked somewhere. Darn it. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's what happens when I just get ahead of myself. Where are we at? Isaiah 49. All right. But I said, I have told in vain. I've spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely the justice due to me is with the Lord and my reward is with my God. And now says the Lord who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to do what? To bring Jacob back to him. So there's a, there's a restoration of Israel so that Israel might be gathered to him for I'm honored in the sight of the Lord and my God is my strength. He says, is it too small a thing for you uh, that you be my servant to do what? To raise up the tribes to Jacob, to restore the preserved ones to Israel. Looky here. 
I will make you a light to the nations so that my salvation may reach to the ends of the earth. Look at there. Who is supposed to be the light of the world? Israel is supposed to be the light of the world. Who embodied that for himself? Jesus did. John 8 and verse 12. I am the light of the world. Jesus shared that vocation with his followers. You are the light of the world. Matthew chapter 5. Revelation just said that the churches are the light of the world by calling them lampstands. But notice this. How are they to be the light of the world that the, God's salvation will reach to the ends of the earth? You do that by speaking. How do you do that? With the mouth that is a sharp sword. The sharp sword is not just a weapon of judgment. The sharp sword is a weapon that carries forth God's light to the nation and God's salvation to the ends of the earth. Okay? So you're seeing here how Revelation is drawing upon these images that are both messianic and they're both uh, involving the sharp sword that has the functions of both speaking out positively but also potentially speaking out a word of judgment. Okay, And of course, you have Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12, where it says the word of God is living and active and sharper than in any two-edged sword. Some people have thought that this is a reference to the Bible. doesn't mean the Bible. Word of God here means the gospel. The gospel is living, it's active, and it's sharper than a two-edged sword, meaning it's more effective than a weapon. The gospel message is more effective than a weapon because the gospel can pierce as far as the division of the soul and the spirit between the joints and the marrows, it's able to judge the thoughts and the intentions of the heart. Remember how Jesus, with the word coming out of his mouth, the sword that's coming out of his mouth, it's able to also judge people correctly, you know, judging them and vindicating them or judging them that they are sinners. So there in Revelation, when a mouth, or sorry, when a sword comes out of Jesus' mouth, this is not automatically a negative judgmental image. Okay, it's by the way, it's it's a it's a it's not a real weapon. It's just his words. But his words, as we've seen throughout the Old Testament, these words can either be comforting, they could be beneficial, they could be guiding in a positive sense, but if need be, these words are going to chastise, they're gonna bring the rod of discipline, and maybe they're gonna bring the rod of judgment. Okay? I mean, look at that, just that little phrase there. Just look at the old testament, seeing how this works. <clears throat> You're seeing there. That Jesus' weapons, this is the way that Jesus uses weapons in the book of Revelation. Doesn't, he doesn't use real weapons. He accomplishes things with the words of his mouth. And what we're going to see in the, uh, in the letters to the seven churches is that Jesus uses this two-edged sword against the churches first. The churches first need to have the words coming out of Jesus' mouth as a message of hope. But if they need to repent, then he needs to warn them with the words coming out of his mouth as a message of judgment, as a message of chastisement, and as a message of discipline. Okay? That's extremely important, and that gets left out of nearly every reading of Revelation that I've heard preachers do. <clears throat> okay. Um, let me stop right there and kind of catch my breath a little bit. I, I want to I hear from some people some, some responses from that. Okay, like how does that make you feel? What do you think? I'm going to stop sharing my screen so I can see everybody. Not everybody at once. Well, nope. I, I just think that, I think I've always known that the, the sword, um, what is the phrase again, that out of his mouth um, is the sword of the spirit. Is that what it says? Well, Ephesians yeah. 6 says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God, which is still another reference to the gospel message. Right. But even still, I've always thought that it was his words that were, that was the power that he carried. I mean, because if you look at the reference to that, um, all through the gospels, what he, wherever he was, it was his words that, that either condemned or not necessarily condemned, but had a person, you know, repent, condemn themselves and, and change and repent. Or when he spoke to the Pharisees and, and, and those people that it was always constantly and um, kind of showing them that, I mean, anyway, it was just the power of God's 
words that, um, and Jesus's words that um, made him more powerful than any other person. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I never really thought of that um, sword, you know, gosh, I can't remember the phrase. I'm just, um, I don't know. But anyway, I never thought that that was really the sword, sword, like a weapon to injure and harm um, anybody, but that it was words. So <clears throat> well, a lot of people have uh, taken the book of Revelation and thought that it is uh, a book that is talking about violence. Um, and, and they've, they've looked at the picture of, of Jesus riding on a white horse with the sword coming out of his mouth in Revelation 19 as Jesus coming back to enact violence on people. Um, but, but, that, but Jesus never, um, this is not a real sword. The way that Jesus um, interacts with people is with his words, either the words to encourage and comfort or the words to, to chastise discipline and, and, and to call to repentance. So it's, it's just interesting that for all of the warrior imagery and all the conquering imagery that is used of Christ is never given a real weapon. His weapon involves what he says. And to me, that's, could that's that two-edged sword? I'm sorry? Could that, could that two-edged sword represent both um, chastisement on one side and um, blessing on the other. I mean, I don't know. I, I, yeah, I'm just kind of that, that. probably that. I think that's possible. I mean, most swords were two-edged swords back then. So, um, uh, you know, it, you, might, you might be onto something there. Yeah. I mean, granted, bo both of them could, you know, get the job done. But um, anyway, I just it's, it's, I appreciate that insight. Okay, uh, Jer Derek raised his hand. Uh, I think the um, the reference back to Hebrews four twelve is is a really good one because the context of that chapter is obedience to that word that they're hearing, and the writer's saying if you don't obey this word, this very same word is the one that's going to judge you. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah. I mean, my my point is. Revelation is not saying anything brand new, okay? This, this is not some sort of, like, this is this is something we've already seen uh, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And, of course, Pam brought out the, the reference there with the, the full armor of God, where the sword of the Spirit is the word of God. The full armor of God does not involve an actual weapon. It involves the gospel message. So, okay, uh, Dean raised his hand. To add on to what I think Pam indicated, or whatever, um, the words of Christ will be very powerful and it goes back to Genesis 1-1 where God spoke things into existence the power of his words and Jesus Christ is the perfect representation of his father therefore those words will have the same power right same power and the same authority um, and, and, and that's the point, is that if the book of Revelation is indeed the essence of the words of Christ that, are, that he received from God, then it bears a lot of authority that we can't just easily dismiss. We can't just say, ah, I don't really want to read it. I don't really care. Um, you know, the church needs to, to prayerfully and humbly wrestle with these things and to say, if Jesus is speaking in this way, how am I supposed to respond with it? So, okay. Um, let me. Uh, uh, Julie had, had something. Oh, okay. Um, I just see in everything that we're seeing here, and then Derek was talking about in Hebrews, you know, four twelve, the context of it, where obedience is constantly there. <laughs> You know, faithfulness and obedience are constantly being brought back to our remembrance, being brought, told us that this is important, you know, which we, you know, we've talked about this for a long time about, you know, that it's not just once saved, always saved, but faithfulness and obedience are required. And we just see this over and over again in what you're teaching tonight. And, um, and I think the other thing is that we, you know, that we sometimes forget how powerful that um, 
you know, that the this, this scriptures are. When we speak the gospel, when we speak the truth, when we speak the, the word of God to people, and we, you know, we do that when we have the spirit of God in us and we're speaking those words, they are very powerful and they will, they will penetrate people's hearts, you know? So it's important that we understand how strong words can be when we speak to people and what an effect they can have on them, either to bring them back to repentance or to gather them to start with, to, you know, to get them to hear the message of the kingdom and understand what the hope is. And then again, if it's someone that already knows that to bring them back to repentance. Right. Good point. Well said. I do think it's interesting, too, that the letters to the seven churches are Christ's words to people that are already Christians. These are not people that need to be converted. These are people that are already Christians, and he needs to speak to them. And five of those seven churches receive a message of rebuke. It's only two of those churches are doing what they're supposed to do. So, um, so, we, so here's the thing. This two-edged sword that's coming out of the mouth of Jesus, it, that, that, uh, that involves us. We need, we need to listen to Jesus' words, and, and maybe, we, maybe we need to, you know, change and shape up, you know, and, and you know, get back on the, the straight and narrow. Okay, so his right hand held the seven stars, power, uh, you know, an image of, of, of power and authority, um, possessing the seven stars uh, in control of the seven angels, and that's probably a representation of all the angels, since seven, remember seven is a number of completion, and out of his mouth comes a uh, sharp two-edged sword, and his face was shining, sorry, it was like the sun shining in its strength, okay? <clears throat> um, let me go to a passage here. That'll, that's pretty easy to demonstrate, okay? In Daniel chapter 12, in verse 2, um, it says right here, Many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake, these to everlasting life, but others to disgrace and everlasting contempt. Those who have insight will shine brightly like the brightness of the expanse of heaven. Okay? Notice these are those who have been raised to everlasting life. If you've been raised to everlasting life, there is a brightness and a shining that is taking place. Okay? And... And it seems that, that Jesus in his glorified state, and of course, if you've been spending 2,000 years, I mean, Jesus now has been spending 2,000 years in the presence of God. I mean, he's just going to be glowing and reflecting the glory of God. So Jesus there, his face is shining uh, like the sun in strength. That's just an image of, of resurrected people. Jesus has been raised in mortality. The image there is one who is, his face is shining. Um, I mean, this is, this is a very, very powerful image there. So you got his hand. You've got his mouth, you've got his face, <laughs> and how does John respond? When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. I mean, that's his response. There's no arrogance here. There's no pride. I mean, he just, he's so overwhelmed that he just, he nearly dies. And notice what Jesus does here. He places what on me? He places his right hand on me. Remember that? Remember the right hand? The right hand was controlling all of the angels. That right hand, that was a symbol of authority and power. When he places his right hand on his shoulder or his right hand on him, that right hand is also an image of comfort. See right there? Jesus can have two images. He can have an image of power and authority, but also an image of comfort within a few verses. Same right hand, okay? The same Jesus who is ruling and reigning, you know, in heaven right now, as we await the consummation of the kingdom on the earth, the one who has control even of all the angels is still able and willing to give comfort to his people in the here and now. I mean, do you think that'll preach? You think that's relevant for people? Do you think, you think persecuted people need to hear that? I think they do. Okay, I mean, and that's just a very, very powerful image there. He said on here, don't be afraid. Don't, don't fear, don't be afraid, okay? I am the first and the last, okay? Uh, here again, Jesus is, uh, he's, He's, he's taking a title. He's not taking a title. There are titles that belong to God, but God has shared his titles and God has shared his name, his authoritative name with Jesus. So Jesus can share in these titles that God originally has. In the book of Revelation, God is called the Alpha and the Omega and Jesus is called the Alpha and the Omega. In the book of Revelation, God is called the first and the last and Jesus is called the first and the last. That doesn't mean that Jesus is God. 
That means that God has shared his name and God has shared his authority and his titles with Jesus, the exalted Jesus. And Jesus as God's representative, as God's agent, fully represents God and what God stands for. Okay, There's still two persons there. There's God that's standing off in the background, and Jesus the one that is standing between um, us and God, representing God in the fullest sense. Okay, Now, how do we know this? Because he says, I am the first and the last, and I am the living one, and I was dead. Okay, Nowhere in the Bible does God die. God is not the living one who was dead. Jesus is the one that died. So Jesus, you could say Jesus is the first and the last, but he's the first and the last that died. This is the, the big distinction between the two of them. God can't die. God's eternal. God is from everlasting to everlasting. Jesus died for three days. Okay, he was dead. Just dead, dead, dead. Okay, unconscious, asleep in the grave, awaiting resurrection. Behold, I am alive forevermore. And because Jesus has been raised from the dead, because he has already taken control of death, Jesus now has the keys of death and Hades. Okay, because Jesus already conquered death. He now possesses the keys of death and Hades. Hades is just a Greek word for the grave. So saying that you have the keys of death and Hades means you have control over death. He's able to take the keys and to unlock whatever door or gate that is and to take people out of death, to take people out of Hades. Okay. Now, let me ask you this. Do you, do you really think that Jesus has a keychain with keys on it? Probably not. I mean, you see the imagery here. Say you have the keys of death and Hades, it means you have control over them and you can unlock them at will. Okay. And Jesus is able to do this because he is the one who um, was dead. He is now alive because he, he has conquered death by being raised from the dead. And now he has control over death and Hades, meaning the two of the same things. Okay. Uh, so, whatever you want to say about Jesus in the exalted state, you can say whatever you want about him, but he's the one that died. And that means that he's not Yahweh, he's not the Lord God. Okay. God had to raise Jesus from the dead. Jesus was unable to raise himself. Okay. All right. So because, because Jesus is the first and the last, because Jesus is the one that is all powerful, controlling the angels, but can take that power and can comfort John because Jesus is the one that died and conquered death and he's alive forevermore. And he possesses the keys to unlock the grave. Verse 19, therefore, therefore, because of all of those things, this is why John is supposed to write the things. Notice that you have already seen all these things that he's witnessed. The things which are the things that are right now taking place in the seven churches and are right now taking place in God's world, in God's heaven, in the abyss, in the Roman world, and the things which will take place after these things. Okay? Jesus being the first and the last is certainly able to uh, dictate what has happened in the past, what's happening in the present, and what's going to happen in the future. Of course, one of the major things about the book of Revelation is that Jesus has already conquered with his death and resurrection. That's happened in the past, okay? That affects the believers in the present because the age to come is broken into the present because of Jesus' ministry, because of the death and resurrection, because of the gift of the Spirit, Jesus being raised from the dead, all those things. And then, of course, the things that are going to happen. Remember, Jesus is the judge, the kingdom is still awaiting its final consummation. We're still awaiting the return of Jesus, but we're also awaiting the time of vindication. Many people are, are persecuted. They're in tribulation. They're in a sense of crisis. They're awaiting for that ultimate comfort that is going to take place. Okay, so, <clears throat> and then he explains. The interesting thing here, notice this. He, he says, here's a mystery. Remember, we've already talked about the mystery, the word mystery on there. Here is the mystery. Okay, notice this mystery doesn't remain a mystery very long. It gets explained by the end of the verse. You as a reader, or, or if you were one of the original recipients of this book, of this letter, you're invited to, to share in this little counsel of, of Jesus explaining this to John. I mean, you're in the privileged position. You get to hear the explanation of these mysteries. I mean, you're a very privileged person by hearing that. So that's just kind of what I mean, you would read this and the feelings that it would evoke would involve, wow, like I'm, I'm feeling really special. I get to get in on all this inside information, okay? As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, he tells you, seven stars or seven angels, easy enough, okay? And the seven church, sorry, uh, sorry, the seven angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches, okay? Seven lampstands are the seven churches. If we're gonna talk about this, 
A church as a lampstand functions as the temple presence of God's holy people, and a lampstand functions as the responsibility to be faithful witnesses of the gospel. Okay, Jesus is not the only person that preaches the gospel. John also preaches the gospel, and we also preach the gospel. Okay, uh, I'm going to give you a preview. Give you a preview of this, and uh, I'm probably leaving hostages to fortune by doing this because I'm not going to explain the whole thing because we don't have time. <clears throat> I'm going to show you something in chapter 11. You're probably familiar in, in Revelation 11 that there's a vision of two witnesses, a vision of two witnesses. <clears throat> okay, And most people, as you know, have read that vision literally. Two cardinal number witnesses. That's how people have done it. Now, based on everything you've learned about Revelation so far, reading things literally is not your go-to manner of interpretation. You need to ask yourself, what do two witnesses signify in the argument of Revelation? And what do two witnesses signify if it's an image that's being drawn from the Old Testament? So in chapter 11 and verse 3, God says, or the angel says, I will grant authority to my two witnesses. They're going to prophesy for 1260 days. And these are the two olive trees and two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Well, what's a lampstand? Lampstand is a church. These two witnesses sound like they are churches. But maybe you know the answer to this. Maybe you can finish my sentence. By the mouth of two or more witnesses, dot, dot, dot. What's the end of that? By the mouth of two or more witnesses, what happens? Every word of God is established or right. something? Right. Very good. Okay. By the mouth of two witnesses, every fact is confirmed. Okay. So two witnesses is all that you need in order for God's authoritative facts, for God's authoritative words to, uh, to have authority and to be enacted in the world. The two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 uh, are an image of the church in their responsibility to preach the gospel to the world. It is not about two individual persons. It's an image of two witnesses being the church, the capital C church, and its responsibility to be faithful preachers of the gospel to the world as God's holy lampstands. Anyway, um, long time until we get to go and look at all the details of that in chapter 11, but I'm just, uh, I'm giving you the, I'm, I'm giving you the secrets right there. I'm giving you the heads up on that. And by the way, I didn't make that up. That is the, the majority opinion of modern scholars today. <clears throat> so, all right. Um, that's, uh, that's the end of chapter one. Let me kind of get some uh, responses from you folks, okay? Um, how, are you, how are you feeling about the book so far? Is this something that you can follow? Is this something that you can find application for your life? Is it something that you're saying, okay, I, I, I see what he's doing. I see what John is doing. I see what he's preparing us for. What do you think? I think some, somebody raised their hand. I think I, I couldn't see... I think it was Carol, maybe, who raised her hand. Carol, yeah. did you, you have a question? Maybe not. Huh? Maybe not. Okay. Anybody else? Thoughts, comments? What do you think? Did that put anyone to sleep yet? No. <laughs> no. no. I lost it somewhere around the two witnesses and how this is connected. Say that again. Right. Okay. So, so we, we see at the end of, of 1 and verse 20 that lampstands refer to churches. In chapter 11, we see that the two witnesses are called two lampstands. We know a lampstand is a church. We know that they're described as two witnesses. And so, like I said, without getting into all the details of it, <clears throat> the vision of the two witnesses is probably not a vision of two cardinal persons, as in like one plus one. It's probably a vision of of the fact that by the mouth of two witnesses, every fact will be confirmed, meaning that the two witnesses refer to the church in its vocation to be the light of the world, to be faithful gospel preachers to the nations. Anyway, so the vision of the two witnesses is a, is a vision of the church in its responsibility to be faithful lampstands in their preaching of the gospel. <laughs> Like I said, I, 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 I have to point that out because the lampstands are equated with the churches early in chapter, or in chapter one, and they're, they're going to be pointed out later in chapter 11. So I'm already, I'm already trying to, to, to get in our mind that this book is, is 
reminding the church that it has a responsibility to preach the gospel, and that's one of the primary vocations of the church. That's not a miscellaneous thing that, like, whenever we get around to it, maybe if we feel comfortable on a good day, that maybe we'll preach the gospel if the right circumstances show up. No, it's one of the primary responsibilities of the church, and Revelation has to remind its churches of this important fact because many churches today don't think that they have a responsibility to preach the gospel. They think, oh, that's the pastor's job. Right. Heck, most of them don't even know what the gospel is. Yeah. Sadly. Good call. I'm back. I, did, I did have a question. I started poking at my screen and I disconnected myself. Oh, okay. Does every church have an angel? <clears throat> uh, we, we have some indication. <clears throat> Um, if, if, if the, uh, it says the angel, there, there are seven angels for seven churches. Okay. So that seems to indicate that whether it's, it's in reference to a church or if it's in reference to a community that, uh, that there's an angel for each one. Okay. And we have some precedents for this, uh, both in the old and the new Testament, uh, in the new Testament, we can see that there are guardian angels for people. And in the old Testament, we can see, uh, that Israel has its own angel in Daniel chapter 10. We can see that Persia has its own angel. We can see that Greece has its own angel. That's in Daniel chapter 10. Uh, Daniel 10 verses 13 and verses 20 through 21. So, so we, we've got some indicator right. That, uh, right. that angels can represent either nations or communities or cities. And so to say that, that each of these cities or communities have their own angel, that, that, that wouldn't be anything foreign to you know to readers of the old testament so we have an we have an angel in this group uh, i suppose we do and the <laughs> angel's name is valerie oh my god <laughs> <laughs> uh dean's got his hand up um i see your how you're associating the lampstands with 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 the with the um, the two witnesses, um, but I also see down in the context of eleven, and I'm probably getting too far. You're going to have to cover this in detail later, uh, where these two witnesses are murdered, and then they are whatever. Um, so there's a lot embodied in this it's going to have to be explained yeah well, i think we were taught Dustin. we were taught that the two witnesses are going to fly around let's just you know talk about the elephant in the room you know we were taught most of us were taught there's going to be two little angels i don't know who the heck they're going to be but anyways they're going to do miracles and i don't know maybe they are maybe they aren't i'm, I'm just saying that you know my head's kind of like okay gotta unjam but this is a work in progress too. What you're doing is a work in progress. You, we can't, you know, digress and stuff that we've been taught. We don't know where you're going to be going with this, but it's with an open mind, you know, about the two, some dude that's going to be flying and preaching the gospel for God knows how long. And I'm just paraphrasing that these, you know, they're going to get murdered or whatever, but you've already alluded to the fact that you're going to be going into chapters as we progress here so we don't need to you know get into chapter 11 right now or wh wherever that's uh mentioned we can you know hang on and like a good story you know and read it chapter by chapter along with you to progress in our understanding yeah and that's that's okay that's fine we don't have to answer all those things i wasn't making a big point uh, if, if anybody just just i'll give 30 seconds to this if anyone wants just a little bit more verification um in 11 and verse 5 it says that if anyone wants to harm them fire flows out of their mouth one mouth notice that two witnesses only have one mouth not sure. fire not that fire flows out of their mouths fire flows out of their mouth Notice that collectively, they only have one mouth. They have one single voice, okay? So that, that's one of the indicators that the two doesn't really refer to two people because they only have one mouth. And in huh. chapter, in, in 11 and verse 8, um, and unfortunately, my, my NASB actually translates this wrong. It should say, and their dead body, singular. It's one singular corpse in the Greek. Not dead bodies, their dead body. So the two witnesses have one mouth and ultimately 
if they are conquered and killed, in the same way that Jesus, by the way, was conquered and killed for preaching the gospel, they only have one body, one corpse. Okay, so to me, that's a very strong indicator of, of the imagery there, demonstrating that they represent one single entity and not two individual persons. So uh, that, that's just something to to hold you over until we get to chapter eleven. But uh, um, like I said, that's 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 way, way, way. I don't want to say way in the future because I do think that the vocation of the church is, is for today. We will get to uh, chapter eleven way in the future. So anyway, uh, Derek. Derek, yeah, I want to uh, make a comment, and, and I got a question too. Um, when I look at this first chapter, you said you were saying that this is there's this is nothing new. The place I think about is is at the end of Matthew, when Jesus commissions his disciples to go and preach the gospel, and he says, "I will be with you always, even to the end of the age." And here's like a powerful vision of. Jesus is being exalted and with the churches and their mission to, to go and do that. Um, the question I have is about um, the first and the last. As a title, would you say that it, it's representing or denoting the uniqueness? Because I see the way that, that God will use it uh, in Isaiah. He says, um, I'm God. There's no one else. I'm the first and the last. Um, and, and within that passage in Isaiah, he speaks of his ability because he is the only God that he can tell you what is going to happen. And so there you see Jesus saying, I'm the first and the last. And he's saying, who was dead and been raised. And then he tells John, tell them what is going to happen. So with, with God um, investing his authority in Jesus, Jesus can say, hey, I'm the first and the last. Um, because I have been raised um, to immortality by God the Father and given this authority, and now he functions in that way. And so you can see him being closely identified the way um, the Father is identified in Isaiah as being the first and the last, the only God, the one who can, who can, um, the one who can tell you what is to come because the idols can't do that. Would you would you would you say first and last is something that d denotes the uniqueness? Yeah, I, I tend to think that first and the last means that you are <clears throat> you're you're all encompassing. Okay, Jesus is the one that uh, that begins God's kingdom, and He's the one that's going to consummate God's kingdom. Okay, he, He's the one that um, you know because He's gone through life and death. And he's come out the other end, the only person that we, that alive today that can say that. Um, you know, that, that gives you a full perspective on life. Um, I, I do think, though, that the, the, the title, first and last, he's just drawing from Revelation. I don't think it's necessarily a, an allusion to, to Isaiah. Um, it, it might be, but, it, but the, the titles do show up for God and Jesus, both first and the last, and Alpha and the Omega in Revelation. Piece. So, um, but I, I think you've got, you got the right gist of it there. It's that, that God has given his authoritative name over to Jesus. That's what Philippians 2.10 says. God has given Jesus a name, which is above every name. And, uh, and, and I think because of Jesus' experience and because he's been exalted, you know, and, and has all power and authority on heaven and on earth, that then Jesus uh, can say those things. He, he can say that he, he's, he's all encompassing in, in his authority. Uh, and the purpose of this is to give, um, it's, I mean, is to give the readers a reason to listen to this. I mean, we, we, we can't just ignore what's being said here because the, the person who possesses all authority on heaven and on earth has written this for our, you know, for our instruction and for our benefit. So it, it, it's to give authority to those words and to persuade the readers as to why they need to take them very seriously. Because there are a lot of Christians that don't think that they need any more reproof. That's why five of the seven churches are told they need to repent by Jesus. So um, I, I'm, not, I'm not so worried about the Christological implications. I'm asking, what are the ethical implications? Like, what am I supposed to do with this? Like, what is the force behind it? Like, how is it trying to persuade me as a reader? If, if, I don't know if that makes any sense or not. Did, did I have that answer a, your question? That's true. Okay. 
I, I have a, uh, a comment about um, this first 16, that last phrase, his face was like the sun shining in its strength. I, I, I was reminded of a couple of things, one from the scriptures and one not from the scriptures. The, uh, I, I, I can envision that, you know, in terms of hearkening back to the Old Testament, that this is hearkening back to when Moses came down off the mountain and his face was shining so much that people couldn't even look at him and he had to put a veil over his face. And I, I've never really thought about that that much. Um, I, or I, it's never quite made sense to me because we see lights all the time and we look at them, you know, it, it's not like it's a problem. But if you think about in the ancient world, a, a bright light, you know, fires were not, fires were not bright. The bright light was the sun. And so last year when we had the eclipse, one of the things that stood out to me was just how bright the sun is. That even when the sun was almost fully and completely blocked by the moon, where there was just a, a little dot of light, because we, we had the full equip, eclipse here. And I'll never forget this, that when the, um, when the sun was coming back out, I had my, my protective glasses off and that first little dot appeared almost instantly you couldn't look at it because it was so painfully bright mm -hmm. that the that the sun and i started thinking about the fact you and, and when the sun is in its strength when it's high in the sky and it's in its full light you cannot look at it, it you know, you cannot you 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 can try you look up and you will instantly look away because you cannot do that and i thought wow it's it's almost like it's saying again hearkening back to when moses was bright and had to put a veil over his face that what that that same thing has happened to jesus only it's like the sun in its full strength you can't possibly look at it at all yeah that's cool i just think it's cool good point <laughs> Anybody else have any questions? Anything I, I left out? And try to be thorough without being boring. Dustin, trust me, you're never boring. <laughs> I was thinking, boring? Never, never boring. It was a great teaching. It was wonderful. Thank you so much. I learned lots. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for showing up, Stacey. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'm happy to help. <clears throat> I'm going to stop the recording here unless anybody else has a pressing question. <laughs>